Hello. How are you Hello. doing? Uh, I'm. I'm gonna put a post-it over my face. Your video also disappeared, so come back when you can. Am I back? There you are. Yes. <laughs> I really don't like looking at myself because I, become, I love this mustache. Um. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. That's what people at home don't know is that all during quarantine you were growing the stash, and now they can finally <laughs> see it. I did. I I grew it. Um, partially as a dare well not a dare but um a friend of mine and i decided to just grow facial hair you know we're single people living alone and uh we did it his was different from mine and mine turned out like this and i think he his was he grew a biker mustache i wasn't i didn't see that coming um and i i have this which which our friend nikita stewart <laughs> that made me look like um, a lawyer for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And you know what, Jenna, it was only a compliment. Uh, it, you know, I'm taking it that way, but it's just so apt. Yes, oh yes. Well, thank you to everyone for joining us today. I'm Jenna Wortham. I'm Wesley Morris. We're, this uh, is... We're, uh, we're, we're, I'm in my kitchen. I don't know where you are, but uh, we're two New York Times writers. Second, well, I mean, you've got that great photograph behind you. Anyway, we're two New York Times writers stuck in our houses talking to you guys right now. And this is still processing. <laughs> <laughs> we're rusty, but we shouldn't be because we were just here. We were just doing this. Yeah, but it, it didn't look like this when we were doing it. I know. Well, okay, so we're gonna have a very juicy conversation today and there'll be time at the end for questions. Um, so feel free to submit them through, I guess the, the YouTube channel or there's a, I feel like if you're logged in, there's a way to submit questions, but we'll be reading them throughout and at the end. Um, but before we get into our discussion today, Wesley, will you join me for just a deep, collective breath, and I hope everyone at home will do it too, just to tune in, to drop into the space, and to really just be present in this moment. Yes. Okay, so let's start. We're gonna do three. To begin, we're just gonna exhale all the air out of our lungs, like you're blowing out birthday candles. Inhale. Let it go. One more time, in, hold at the top and let it out. Just do one more, everybody in, hold at the top and release. Whoa, you know, I was gonna have a drink before we started, but I don't need that because I just did a breathing exercise with Jenna Wortham. I think I'm good. <laughs> that was really relaxing. I mean, you have helped me with my breathing and I, it is, it has really made a difference for my nerves and my patients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we're here today. We're gathered here today. Oh my because this country won't quit. It really won't quit. And, you know, you and I had been planning on doing a live event anyway. Um, we were trying to figure out what something sort of vaguely mid-June pride related might look like. And then that kind of went on pause um, as the uprisings began. And we were sort of scrambling to figure out just kind of what this new reality was and what was going on. And then you and I had a conversation, Wesley, and you were really eager to get back in the studio. You were really eager to work out some thoughts and some things. And so hopefully we'll be back in production soon because <laughs> we just can never rest. I guess that's just the plight of being black in America. Um, but in the meantime, because we had this plan for a live-ish event anyway, 
we thought we'd use this time to just talk through some of the things that have been coming up for us. But I wanted to hand it to you, Wes, because you really, you know, you really wanted us to hold the space. And I'm so curious to kind of step into that moment about why. Well, um, I don't know, like something, something, something really seismic is happening right now. And I think, I mean, you know, you and I talk many times a day and, or we communicate with each other many times a day. And I had just really, you know, I've been feeling a real heaviness, you know, really since we had to come in the house, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and watching, just monitoring the, the health of people in the world and making sure that everybody's, you know, as okay as they can be. And, you know, I think that there was a real rumbling of something in me around the time of Ahmaud Arbery's death, um, or the time, or around the time that we found out um, nationally that Ahmaud Arbery had died in the way that he had, um, courtesy of a video that one of his killers made, or one of the people that helped kill him, I don't know. But it began, um, I don't know, it just sort of induced in me this heaviness and it only got worse or heavier um, as the weeks passed. And um, I, after George Floyd, um, and you know, Breonna Taylor, Nina Pop, um, I mean, there are any, there's so many people. Tony McDade. Tony McDade, I mean. Ayanna Dior, so many people. Um, too many. And I think that, you know, like everybody else um, who saw the George Floyd video, um, it was, it's important to remember though, that the same, the, that, that morning, that morning's racism was a kind of more run of the mill, you know, outrageous form of racism, right? Where, um, this this New York birder is in Central Park doing his thing, looking at birds. Uh, his name is Christian Cooper, and he is he, he sees this loose dog, this unleashed dog, sort of doing its thing around him. And its owner, he asks the owner to put the dog back on the leash, and you know they have a whole conversation. And you know he winds up taking out his cell phone, recording this infraction that this woman is, is, is performing by not having this dog on the leash. She calls the cops. Um, she tells him that she's going to call the police and say that an African-American man is threatening her life, is what she says. Mm -hmm. um, and we all have seen the video at this point, or many, many, many of us have. And that was, that was, the, that was, the, that was breakfast on Memorial Day. And Later in the evening, um, George Floyd is killed. And I think that there's, there was something about the combination of, of two different but related forms of racism happening within 12 hours of each other. Yeah. Um, that really just just rocked me. And the fact that we could see them both unfold more or less ultimately in their entirety, I think it just dispelled, I mean, I don't know how many, how much um, work you've been doing in your life trying to convince different people of the reality of these incidents, but you know, a lot of what it is to be a black person in this country is to also be a Cassandra which is essentially a person who is, you know, in, 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 in you know, Greek classicism is a is mythology, is, you know, a Cassandra is essentially a person who is trying to tell you that something is happening or going to happen or is true and is essentially persecuted for, for it. Um, but there was something about these images being able to proliferate around the planet in a, in a, in a we told you this is what's happening and you've had more, you don't need the videos, you shouldn't need the videos, but here they are. And I think that there was a last straw aspect to this. I mean, all the things that people have sort of begun to talk about, but for me, 
with respect to you and talking about this, I just felt like there is a kind of, um, there's something, the heaviness that I was talking about, something was passing through me. And I compared it to you the other day. I compared it to being like a, like a stone that you're passing. And it's very painful and um, it's hard to articulate um, what exactly it is, but you know what it is. It's all of the stuff. You know, it's centuries of, of, of you know, abuse, pain, <laughs> dehumanization, degradation, being a Cassandra, right. um, and having all of this, you know, evidence. You know, we don't need videos. There are people who've been writing about this for centuries. There, are, there, you know. there have been videos. There have been right. images. There have been videos. And I think as cathartic as it feels that the whole world right now is paying attention to our plight and our suffering and our struggles, it's also invoking so much pain and so much trauma. And, you know, it's, it's also one of the things we're reckoning with is that part of the reason that people are paying attention is because white people are also getting you know, the brunt of this violence and attention at, and sorry, yeah, I mean, you know, violent attention at demonstrations, at protests, right? And so those images are really shocking to America of journalists, right, being treated with total disregard. Like, like everybody basically now is an N-word and like, that's the thing that pushed this forward. It wasn't us saying, this has been happening Yep. You know, this is my experience. People have, have disbelieved or not been willing to believe. And, and now, you know, it's impossible not to see. You have to try really hard not to see it. And it's just invoking all the times we've kind of shoved those memories or those experiences or those feelings down because we couldn't air them or the risk of airing them was too, too much. And that's the grief that I'm sitting in, right? But meanwhile, you know, we're still dying. Like, meanwhile, mm -hmm. lives mm -hmm. are being lost. Black lives are being lost. And mm -hmm. still, right now, still. Um, you know, thinking of the young Black trans who was killed in Philadelphia. We found out about this morning, Dominique, you know, and, and sitting with that pain, like it's not over. Um, but y'all are just getting hip to it. And so we have to sit with that. And it's really, really, really difficult. It's just so beyond difficult. And, and I think, one of the reasons you and I wanted to gather today is because we're still in a pandemic, right? We still are in a pandemic as we're fighting for our lives and we can't hold a repast. We can't hold a barbecue. We can't meet and hug and cry and share in this grief. And so we're, we're doing this together in the hopes that it helps other black people sit and process and transmute and feel a little less alone because the, the alienation of the pandemic has not gone away while we're still being bombarded with all these images, oftentimes through the same feeds that are mm -hmm. keeping us feeling connected to other people. Um, so that's part of the offering for today. Yeah. Oh, I'm just seeing there's a question um, in the chat from a person named Alexis. Hi, Alexis. And this might be a nice thing to just, you know, ask right now, which is what was the last thing you ate that brought you joy? <laughs> I love this question because um, you and I really do work through our grief through our stomachs, so. The uh, last thing I ate, well, Jenna, you, you know, I mean, if you had to guess what the last thing I ate today would have been, <laughs> I mean, it, it made me happy because I was eating. It wasn't the greatest version of that thing, but what do you think it was? Okay, I have two guesses. My yeah. first guess are beans. Yeah, okay, good guess. And then my second, okay, my second guess, is a biscuit. <laughs> Y'all, Wesley and I went through this whole thing. It almost ended our friendship where Wesley was like oh, making Edna Lewis's biscuits. I'm not gonna go all the way into it, don't worry. But we just had this moment where you were like, I have a confession. Isn't a biscuit a dinner roll? And I was just like. <laughs> no, Je <laughs> you can from Virginia, no. sir. You can't blast me like that because you've taken all the context away. Jenna Wortham, you guys, also world-class journalist driving a bus over me. 
<laughs> that's cool. Because what really happened was that I, what, what you asked me in that moment was, what am I going to put on the biscuits? Yeah, yeah. I said, and do you I was like, tea? nothing. I'm going to put butter on the biscuits. I mean, I don't even know how I put it, but I was like, that is the most offensive question I've ever heard. It's a biscuit. And um, I did some, I ate the biscuit. That I made the biscuit exactly the way Edna Lewis said to make it. Except Edna Lewis, as I've walked many people through at this point, she does not believe she's, Edna Lewis was born, I believe, in 1909. Um, she was born wow. in, the, in the early part of the, of the 20th century. So uh, she has feelings about the way food was made because it's, it was made differently than it is now. And she wanted a single acting baking powder. And I have been told by many a person that double acting uh, baking powder is just as good as single acting now. It doesn't create, create that aluminum taste that she didn't like. Anyway, I did it exactly the way she did it. And the biscuit, it just became clear to me when you asked me that question and we were gonna have a fight that I needed to take a second and just calm down and really think about philosophically and practically what a biscuit was actually doing. Cause we didn't, eat. I'm from Philadelphia. I'm from Philadelphia all the way back to like the middle of the, of the 19th century as far as my family can tell. Exactly. And my dad's side of the family is like from South Carolina from his back as far as, from, from as far back as we can tell. But my grandmother died, my paternal, my paternal grandmother died when I was a kid. My maternal grandmother died you know, two months ago, three months ago. So I've only ever eaten that side of the family's cooking in a meaningful way. And we didn't eat biscuits. We didn't eat grits. So wow. in the meantime, when I make a biscuit. <laughs> so wait, is that the last thing you ate that brought you joy? No, it's wrong. You're wrong. Oh, I just. But you've done a bad guess. What's the other like thing? That. It's a tuna just sandwich. Okay. Tuna sandwich. Okay. <laughs> all right all right that's fine good you love a tuna sandwich it's fine i'm just glad i'm not in the studio with you while you're eating it which is normally where i am while you're having it <laughs> um okay the last thing the last what thing did you eat? i ate that brought me joy um well i've been really into my herbal medicine you know just really soothing myself with my tinctures and my tonics and i've actually been i made this I have it right here as well you have your biscuit off camera i have my Danky nettle tea with borage flowers, a little bit of organic honey in it. That's a lemon. Um, that's been bringing me a lot of joy because nettle is, uh, it's many things, but it's also used for protection, which I desperately feel like I need right now. We all need, all black people need. And um, it's just really calming. It's really calming and really soothing. And borage is for courage. So I've almost said courage, but it's for courage. And so that's been keeping me, it's been really making me feel held in this deep way. Mm. Um, okay, well, I mean, one of the other things that you and I wanted to talk about, which was the ways in which, you know, we're, we're dealing with this kind of onslaught of change and we're being asked to parse out in real time how meaningful this change is. You know, the New York Times had a piece um, a day or two ago, time is so strange, I'm like, it could have been 10 days ago or 10 hours ago. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there was a piece about how support for Black Lives Matter, you know, it's there's more support now in the last two weeks than there's been ever, right? And just like trying to wrap your mind around that, you know, and just like how quickly conversations are shifting. Yeah. And I I personally feel like, you know, we were fighting to get those words acknowledged you know, five, six years ago, a year ago. And now we're fighting to make sure people remember what they mean because mm -hmm. they're just becoming a slogan, I worry. I mean, that's my worry, you know? Um, I feel like we're in real danger of Black Lives Matter becoming a commodity or something that just totally gets diluted. Um, I, I want to sit with that for a second though. Okay. Because I just want to really, I want to enjoy it meaning something right now. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, <laughs> I, okay, we, we vowed we wouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it to make a point. And that was like, oh, no. who, who's being centered in this conversation? 
But oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But just to make just to make this point, um, do it, do it. If five years ago somebody had gone up to Mitt Romney or like even during his Senate campaign and said, uh, Senate candidate Romney, do do Black Lives Matter? And he would have said, well, reporter asking this question of me right now, all lives matter, don't they? I mean, shouldn't every life matter? All, all lives, not just black ones, all. So this guy is at a protest outside the White House. Was it this mm -hmm. week? And I you know, must have been. To have somebody's been. like, Senator Romney, why are you here? And he's like, because black lives matter. So it's wild. I, I, I'm with you about the commodification of that term, but I'm just gonna enjoy the struggle that the people involved with that organization and black people in general, talk about a bunch of Cassandras. I mean- Of course, no, I'm not trying to, and I mean, you know this. Oh, I know, I know, but- Yeah, I, I'm not trying to take it away from you. You but, were asking the right question. Um, and then, yeah, yeah, cause also like, I mean, it's, it's, hap it's, this is the strange paradox of this moment, right? Like this is the acknowledgement and recognition that we want. And yet some of the ways in which this moment is being acknowledged and black life is being recognized as, as, as mattering, it's also kind of, it's happening in a way that I think runs the risk of being purely a pylon or purely like for show or performance or for optics, you know, it's like, it has to be meaningful. It has to be meaningful, you know? And, and so what I mean when I say that is, you know, um, you know, Walmart, I read the other day, Walmart, I, I, I'm really about to lose my mind when I say this. So just bear with me, Wesley, but like Walmart, here was with like, you. Black Lives Matter, we're not gonna, I always pluralize the matters. I don't know, my brain can't help it, but I do know what the slogan is, but I just, I always, anyway. Walmart was like, yes, Black Lives Matters, and we're not gonna lock up the black hair supplies anymore. You feel me? You feel me? Like that kind of thing, right? Like Starbucks is like, our employees can't, y'all say that, you can't wear anything that says BLM, you can't, but we're gonna make sure that support the cause and mail them out. It's just like, well, which is it? Right. Which is it? You know, right. like Walmart, like if you actually think black life matters, then pay, the black people that work for you a living wage, pay them what you owe them. I'm turning into Rihanna, pay them what you owe them, you know? And, and so that's, that's what I'm saying is like, I worry that it becomes enough just to say it and not actually do it. Right. And to but not actually put policies in place that mean our lives and our quality of life, right? Actually matters. I will say, I mean, okay. So yes, I and mean, of course, of course, of course. But I mean, just just what you just just Walmart's decision to to like unlock the black grooming products. I have to say, as a person who's been in different cities in the United States and have had to go up to the counter and and find an employee to like get my Dax or my soft sheen. I feel you. I feel you. It is, feel it is you. the most infuriating thing. And usually most of the time, the employees that you're asking are other black people who are like, don't, don't even come at me with this. I know, I know it is, yeah. it is. I mean, the little, the little things that we accept as normal, the idea that those things, because of this moment, the symbols, just to focus on the symbols, the policy questions we can get to in a second. But like, this is the moment where all of the, I mean, the, 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 the hair care being and the grooming being locked up isn't just a symbol, but it's incredibly metaphorical. Yeah. Um, but the meetings, I would love to have been at that first meeting when they decided, when CBS and Wall, all, of these, all of these stores decided, well, you know what? We just have to, we have to lock that up. You know, the Afro sheen has to be put away. You know, even the shaving products, like the magic shave was, was also one of those things that like, I don't know, it's just wild to think about the admissions, the, the admissions of guilt 
that, that have to first happen and they're symbolic, but they're not meaningless. I'm not saying that you're saying they're meaningless, but they're an important oh, I am opening saying salvo. I am, I am though. Okay. I am okay. though. I am. Okay. Okay. Like, and it's, it's funny because this is a very classic Wesley and Jenna moment. Like I'm, I'm actually chuckling inside because <laughs> I do feel like this is the most you and me way to talk about this thing. And I am saying it's not enough. Like it's not totally devoid of meaning, but I do feel some type of way, you know, when I open Amazon Prime Video and it's like Black Lives Matter. It's like here, watch um, Black AF or, and I'm like, nah gee that, that that's that's not it like you, you got to do more you know and and there was there were these headlines like amazon is no longer gonna work you know allow the fbi to use its facial recognition software and everyone was like yay but if you I'm read the fine print yeah. it was like unless it's necessary i'm like who is deciding what's necessary i think i'm just really calling for an additional hyper awareness because you, I mean, I'm, the, listen, I was in the park today having lunch and with a friend, socially distant, um, and just taking a break offline. One of my um, meditation healer friends, we were just really taking in the air. And, you know, it's, it's in New York now. It's as common as hearing a siren or anything else. You hear, you hear the cheers of, of Black Lives Matter. And it, it, it brings me to tears. And I was, I was running a little late for this. I, I stopped to watch the procession and it was actually children it was a ton children in the middle of bedside saying black kids matter and i was just openly weeping like this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like it it matters right like that symbolism i mean it, that's not symbolism that's like policy and action you know like that is that to me is, is a is a political action that's so important and i'm like yes this is this is what it means to be alive right now in this moment in 2020 you know but but i do feel a type of way when I open Instagram and at the top, it's like, you know, let's talk about BLM. And I'm just like, yeah, but you, 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 this is a company that makes a lot of money off Black Lives Mattering and Black Lives Not Mattering. And so I, and I'm not in those rooms. So maybe there are more conversations happening, but I'm just like, y'all got to show us more. And it mm -hmm. needs to be more than this because this is a global problem. And it's not just enough to put a banner on it. The banner is not a band-aid. Right. Now, I agree. But so, okay, so what do you think? Because I actually, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about what, the, the question is always, you know, Oprah had her, had her two-night special um, mm -hmm. a couple of days ago asking, where do we go from here? And had, you know, some of America's great thinkers wrestling with this question. Um, and there's no answer, right? I mean, there's no one answer. But I think one of the things that's that's really important is, you know, I'm not going to stop at saying I want my grooming products unlocked from the plastic casing that they're in at at the drugstore. I'm. I think we should ask for everything. There's not a thing we shouldn't be yes. asking for. Yeah. I mean, there's. I mean, shoot the moon. I want to shoot Saturn. Like this is this is the moment where there is no crazy thing to ask because if you know anything about what's happened in this country, everything that's led to this moment is the crazy thing. Right. And asking right. to undo right. it is the only sane thing we can do. And I feel like asking for, asking for as much as we, as we can get, um, because I mean, I've said this to you, and I'm just gonna mm -hmm. I'm gonna float this out here. I don't know. This is not a this is not really truly tested material. Oh, but okay. I think I think treating I think that um, it is really important to think about what it means to treat all all Americans like black people and. Let everybody feel what that feels like. I think that that is a thing that you alluded to earlier with the protests and white people either seeing or experiencing what it's like to be at the police, at the police hand, at the hands of the police, yeah. you know, at the whims of the police in some That's cases. Right. That's right. Um, I think that the, the, you know, let, let everybody go to a crappy public school or like an underfunded public school in this country that is like actively, actively starved of resources, actively neglected. Um, mm. 
I think that there is a real, the problem in this entire situation has always been a matter of empathy. It's always been not being able to imagine that the people undergoing all this unequal treatment were actual people or that they didn't deserve yes. that. Yes. Because what was happening with these other shootings before? Right. It was, right. there was always, I mean, there would always be somebody who would have some extenuating circumstance that they didn't know anything about, but because of the institutionalization of the police, and I would say like cultural propaganda has a huge amount to do with that. Um, this belief that the police are fundamentally doing their jobs, which is, we all have been sort of brainwashed to believe that they can do no wrong, like institution. Yeah. And I think there's like one of the things that was, that's been happening the whole time, at least in this recent spate of killings, was the extenuating circumstance or extenuating excuse. Well, they must have done something. Michael right, Brown right, must have right. done something. Eric right. Garner must have done something. But that question of what they did is immediately, right. the, cost, the cost can't, I mean, the cost can't be their life. Or selling That's new right. So it's like the next or, question is so what, right? right so right. what? Like it doesn't give the police free license just to kill people, right? Like just to shoot people at will. Like it, it, or you know, I mean, all the other things they do. But yeah, I I agree. I'm I'm listening. So I'm saying that what we've got right now is the closing of an empathy gap, and some of that is just pure empirical experience on behalf of some of these people who were marching alongside black people. Yes. Um, and it's the experience of understanding. And I don't know, I mean, this is, there's no way to quantify this, but I wonder how far out the empathy goes, right? And this is why well, I'm saying there's no, there's no thing that should not be demanded right now in some ways. But I but my asterisk to your point is that there's an empathy gap that's being closed. And I'm, I think I'm really urging for a watchfulness around how much empathy there is and kind of where it's, where it's being directed, right? Because the, the world and the country is outraged about George Floyd and that same vector of outrage and anger is not being directed towards what happened to Breonna Taylor, what happened to Tony McDade. And so, what is interesting to me right now and, and what I'm really um, thinking through is how do we make this moment as intersectional as possible and remind everyone that all Black lives matter, right? Like women matter, you know, queer people matter, trans Black people matter, you know? And, and I think that it's, it's been tough because, you know, it's, it's mixed, right? Like there's, there is a lot of empathy around Mr. Floyd, but is that empathy being shared from Ms. Taylor, right? Is that empathy being shared from Ms. Dior, who was attacked in Minneapolis as well, you know? And so that's the thing that for me makes me, you know, there was a question I see in the comments um, to named Maria about, do we feel any sense of hope? It's like, well, whenever I feel any surge of hope by the throngs of people at any given point in Brooklyn who are demonstrating, who are protesting, right? I have this other part of me that's like, but it needs to be inclusive. It has to be inclusive because if not, then we're just perpetuating the same, you know, systemic, misogynistic, patriarchal problems. It can't just be about, there has to be enough empathy for all of us. It cannot just be about cis black men, right? Um, who are suffering at the hands of state violence. You know, it has to be about everybody. Um, so that's kind of where I get a little bit tripped up, but I do want to say, okay, so I, you know, as you've been talking, I've been thinking and something that is meaningful for me that I've seen, um, because I do think that cultural, cultural shifts do shape societal shifts. I mean, absolutely. And so small shifts like Legos, right? Saying mm -hmm. we're not going to do any more police officer Legos, like cops coming off the air. Although I think that damage has been done, mm -hmm. but as mm -hmm. long as that's a long overdue thing. Um, Gone with the wind being pulled, it's still available. So I don't know, I, like I haven't researched the depth to which that film's been pulled. I mean, again, also, like, I mean, again, so just to your point, yeah. Janet, the, the damage, the damage uh, hasn't been done. Yeah, I, I think that <laughs> it will be really interesting to see like 
well, how are police officers represented on like all the SUV shows, as not SVU shows going forward? Like how are police officers represented from here on out? Like, I think that's actually more interesting to me. But the fact that those shifts are starting to happen um, feel important because like you say, you know, it's like we do get these, we get these images about what law and order mean imprinted into our minds and to sort of start having some of that untangling happen in real time feels like I, I do think that's that I feel strongly about. Now, I don't know how to feel about the first Black Bachelor, though. <laughs> you see, that's, that's the other end of that spectrum for me. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, there is there are limits to there. At some point, and this is what I, I was afraid. I, I didn't realize it would take this quickly. It, it would it would we get to this point. This, this we get to this point this this quickly. But we, we're on the verge of, of a little bit of a farce, right? Because I, I'm not asking, The Bachelor has other problems that it needs to atone for. Yes. I mean, in addition to that, but who, I mean, I didn't read, I don't know exactly, did they cast this guy, by the way? You know, okay. actually, the, a question just came through on it, and I saw the headline and just said, not today. Like, <laughs> mama don't have time yet. I love on people, I love on Twitter, and lately people are like, I had the time, you know? Like, I found this. I got this. I had the time. I have the time yet. I'm going I'm to keep it funky. But I, I do, I am curious what, who, who was this guy? Where did they find it? They, he's just been waiting in the wings? Like, isn't usually, I mean, th there's so much protocol to have the show even work so like how did this get expedited and it hasn't happened in how many years like that's i'm, I'm very curious to read more about never that. right i mean right I, I mean i guess my the reason i'm exasperated by some of these things is because they're not even symbolic they're merely cosmetic right right and i think that you know rachel Lindsay is sort of like an active example of the way in which like that show, I don't want to keep talking about this show, but like, that's okay. just, you know, just say what you want to say. but I think that there's something about, that there's a difference between a, a, a symbolic change and a cosmetic. I think NASCAR vowing to purge its races of Confederate flag imagery is, is an interesting and meaningful symbolic change that I don't see being enforced. There's a little, the, to the degree that I'm a journalist at all, like there's a little <laughs> tiny you. part of me that wants to put on a little disguise and just go down and just check things out. But, cause you can purge all the Confederate flags you want. You know what you can't purge? Uh, my fear of going to a NASCAR race at Talladega. That you very know? valid fear, my friend, don't right. you dare go. I will, I will not let you go. Um, but that's um, the thing. It's like, I don't, I don't like how we're being asked to gauge the sincerity of these decisions. And you, I, it feels like unfair labor that I have to do. Like, I, I can't stop thinking about the NASCAR decision. Right. And, and I, I have, I periodically go and read the comments underneath the tweet that they've made announcing that mm, because I'm just like, you're brave like, are they going to be like an intern? I mean, they're, they're fine, actually. I mean, it's, it's actually pretty, they're not, they're not at all. It's just people are like angry. And then a lot of people are like, lol. And I'm just like, who I'm waiting for now? Like, sorry, our intern, you know, posted that without our permission. I don't understand. <laughs> who is that for? Like, is not, you know, like, do they need more fan? I don't, like, it doesn't feel valid or sincere at all to me. I, mean, I don't I don't appreciate well, having to think about that. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think that part of this reckoning has to a lot of it has to do, I mean, a lot of I mean, for me personally, I think that, you know, I've been doing a lot of thinking about you know, the 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 black person I am. You know, um, yeah. you know, the lineage, I mean, it's a thing that I think about not infrequently anyway, because either I'm forced to or because I'm inclined to do so. But um, I mean, there is, there is a val, there's a validity in this, in the search of one's soul that happens in a moment like this. And the reason that I'm kind of hung up on this empathy question is because I actually think that it is the thing that is plagued the passing of laws, the repeal of laws, 
the introduction of policy, the support yeah. of policy that's introduced in order to get it to become a law. I think, um, I think seeing, you know, in the same way that um, I have been, you know, I've been hearing from a lot of friends and acquaintances and coworkers about, you know, divided family, divided holidays where, or like um, divisive issues at holiday events among families, right? And I'm always grateful because like, that's just not the case in my family. Like things don't get more heated than like somebody wanting to do something funky to the mac and cheese. Like, I, I think that there's something about this moment in which, you know, some of these people who've been frustrated at having to go and have, have meals with their, not, con not just conservative relatives, but maybe Trump supporting relatives who believe all of the rhetoric and the lies um, or, or just spout them and without being aware of what they believe. I think that having an outlet for people to be able to react against that um, is one thing. And I think, I think that's useful, but I guess that I'm not sure whether that's empathy, right? I think yeah. that that in yeah. some ways could be construed as an acting out. Um, I think it could be construed as like sincere and legitimate, legitimate and utterly um, aligned uh, partnership. Um, but yeah. I mean, you and I went on the CBS morning show after, I don't know if you remember this. Um, we met, are you kidding me? Of course. Like I think about <laughs> that all the time. Remember how I try to, remember how I try to hold their Emmy and they were like, no, in the, in the green room. Oh, um, you picture of this? And they were like, no. Anyway, go on. Yes, we um, went on CBS this morning after the um, you know white supremacist rally in Charlottesville. Yeah, and I think Gail King asked us, or maybe it was Nora O'Donnell. I can't remember who asked us this question. Um, but the question was, like, what kind of work do we need to do to to get these things to stop? And we both almost said in unison, not our job. We've been doing not it. Not on us. We've done yeah. it. It's, it is, it, this is, I, it must have been Nora because I feel like I said, Nora, that's your job. Yeah, I think you um, With all due respect to Nora O'Donnell, I just was feeling, you, you caught me in a moment. Um, but, I, but I really believe that. And I think that, you know, we have, we have given, I mean, breadcrumbs, blueprints, you know, instruction manuals, it's all already out there. And I think that one of the things that's important about this moment that's really interesting to think about is like, there are, there are concrete, the ways in which now is different from five years ago mm -hmm. is that Black Lives Matter was repeatedly dogged for not like, what do y'all want? What do you want? Yes. Yes. What do you stand for? You're what do you believe? Doesn't look like other civil rights moments, you know, really your leader? kind of dismissed. Yeah, really, really, really kind of like compressed and dismissed as being not it, which was in hindsight is really interesting to think about. Well, I mean, it was more than that. There was there was a political gatekeeping being done on them. And they mm. weren't about, they were about crashing the gate. And like they, people were like, people had been expecting there to be some, I mean, this was during the Obama administration. So somebody was looking for somebody, they were looking for an Obama. They were looking for, okay. for, for an acceptable yes. presentation of, of yes. leadership. Yes. That I have to say, I mean, I think that's why the question of empathy haunts me, right? Like, I don't know what that means. And I've been revisiting, you know, I mean, in, in terms of processing past trauma, I've been thinking a lot about my early awakenings, you know, my early black political consciousness, early radical awake, revisit old texts that I read, you know, in college and Angela Davis and Kwame Ture. You know, if you haven't listened to, 19, I think it's 1966 speech where Kwame Ture, who at the time is still Glee Carmichael, gives this, this speech about this idea of black power, right, at Berkeley, and is talking about, you know, you can't just accept you know, you can't just have empathy. He talks about empathy. You have empathy for Black people who've decided are good 
or okay, because that in itself, the idea, I mean, that's respectability politics, how you and I talk about it, but the idea, like a type of black life worth fighting for is a tool scene. It is a function of racism. And that's something that, you know, I struggle with because I think um, even being in Brooklyn, like what does it mean to see a procession of people, you know, walking through Fort Greene, Flatbush, bed saying matters and you're white. Does it matter to you? Because from where I'm sitting, I, I, you seem like you have no problem black people out of the city, pushing black people into different neighborhoods, pushing them out of their, you know, historic, historically black. And I mean, there's a, I don't know. It's like, so I think there is this kind of cognitive dissonance to this moment too of like, well, what, it, and I think that's what I keep coming back to. It's like, I can hold the enormity and the magnitude of, you know, and I, in tears, I was, I was crying to the sunset last night, just like really thinking about this kind of recognition that's happened at the same time, this sort of deep reckoning and recognition that I don't trust is happening on a cellular level. Right. And I, because mm -hmm. of all of these ways in which, you know, the history of this country and the history of black people in this world, you know, have not been treated as mattering. And so the idea that there has been a tempo shift in two weeks, you know, is, is there's a learning curve. There's a curve. And I, and I don't trust it just because you've taped up a black, a black power fist onto the front of your business or on the front of your home, you know, it's got to look more, it just has to look more dynamic than that. And so, you know, for this question of, of who, how do we get empathy, right? I think the empathy is there, but I think it's still at a comfortable level. And I'm really interested in the discomforting empathy, right? When, when you're being asked to care about not just black life, when it involves our death, but when you're being asked to care about black life at every single level, right? Like black mm -hmm. life having the same access to housing as you, people having the same job opportunities. I mean, we're seeing this racial reckoning happening online right now where all these people are coming out about experiencing macroaggressions and racism and in and, and different professions and fields from the food industry to media, to writing, to television, to how, I mean, it's unearthing all of these ways in which people have felt marginalized and not in a way that they were called, hey, you're the N-word, right? But like, oh, you're not qualified. And all of these subliminal ways that racism manifests to keep black people from things that white people have to, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I don't know. So I, I just don't, that's the part. I just want to say that I, that's the part for me that I don't think is our work. I think white people really need to look inside themselves and think about how they really feel about black people and face their own anti-blackness because listen, growing up in America, I had to face my own anti-blackness. That's work I had to do because I grew up in a culture steeped in it. So I had to do that work for myself. So I don't believe that you don't have it too. Last thing I just want to say really quickly is that Last um, thing you want to say, like this is your well, show. I'm you sorry, you I know, but I feel like I, you were, you were. I can see you in hand. I know you so well that I know you want to say something. So that's why I was just not like, anymore. Trying to I'm, it. I'm in the choir, baby. Go on. Oh, I forgot. Actually, it'll come back to me. <laughs> Go ahead. It'll, it'll come after all that. I know. <laughs> I keep lighting my Palo Santo because this conversation is making me so worked up. I'm like, I got to, I got to cleanse the air while we're talking. Cause it's really heavy, but, but you, you said you were going to speak. So you speak and then I'll, I'll, well, no, I'll I mean, you were, what you were talking about was you were sort of addressing all of the ways in which things would need to change in order for this to have achieved all that, that it has the potential to. Right. Um, and all of the ways in which, which, which Black Americans have, uh, have been historically deserved. And, yes. you know, but it's funny to talk about history because history, history is, um, it's the present, right? I mean, yeah. the George Floyd's death, that is a 21st century death. It is a 20th century death. It's a yes. 19th century death. It's an 18th century death. He died he died a death that's been died for, for centuries. And yes. so this idea of history is a really, I mean, we've been talking a lot since the pandemic hit. People have been joking about time. And I've been joking about time. 
and how we don't know, even you earlier, you were just knowing what day is what. I feel like there's something about what's happening right now that is, that is beyond us. Yes. It is yes. cosmic. Yes. And Speak, oh, yes. it is, it is a, it is, it is just amazing. It is like somebody sent up a smoke signal, dial, you know, dial for help in 1619. And somebody finally picked up the phone in 2020. And that we is the story of black people yeah. and, and, and trying to get help in general. Yes. And I yes. feel like the cosmic story that's unfolding yes. right now is a call that got placed 401 years ago is that's finally right. being answered. That's right. And we'll see, we'll see what resources show up, but it's finally being answered. And I think that there are these waves and reverberations and these echoes and just all of this um, material that is being, it's an earthquake what we're going through right now. It is, yes. it is an earthquake and shit is moving around and, and, and there are aftershocks as big as the earthquake itself, which I guess makes it another earthquake. I'm not a seismologist. Seismologists in the world hit me and give me the right terminology. But anyway, we are dealing with something that is shaking up a lot of stuff. And these yes. are cracks that have been in a lot of edifices for, mm. for centuries. Like, you know, these things have been ready to be toppled the whole time. It just needed more bodies, more force, more belief, more time to think about what it means to topple and what you put in its place. And we are in the middle yeah. of thinking about all of these things and thinking about them collectively and understanding that the stakes are so high that to get it, to get it wrong, I don't know what getting it wrong looks like. I guess getting it wrong looks like doing nothing. But like, this is why I'm really a big believer in just asking, asking yes. or demanding, demanding the most you know and you you know you i love i'm so happy we're processing this right now because you do always kind of push my thinking forward and and i and i feel like i do start to knit together the pieces of what you're saying um and kind of integrate it into my own thinking while we're talking so thanks for just sharing so freely and vulnerably um but yes to to the to the point that you made about the message in the traveling across oceans, like actual oceans, right? And then being received. And this being a moment at which the world is listening. The world is listening, right? And for all the symbolism and all the, to me, what can feel like superficial performance, there is also an opening, right? There is an opening. What I was gonna say earlier that I, I lost my train on was, you know, I've, in terms of the question of empathy, like getting white stand, how deep the anti-blackness goes, that's not my job. I also am not leaving it to you guys to fix the world, even though you broke it, because I don't trust that. I don't trust y'all to fix what you broke. So I do <laughs> think there is this really incredible opportunity. I've seen people be like, not my problem. Like it's y'all's to fix. And I'm like, do we trust that though? Like, come on, y'all saw get out. Like, no. We're, we're, we, we're in the sequel, okay? We're in the sequel and we all have a co our cotton in our ears and we know you can tap on the teacup all you want. We're not going back into the space. Like we're gonna move forward and we're gonna figure it out whether you like it or not, you know? And I do think that that receptivity is really precious, right? Like people may not understand what they're getting wrong and they, but, but maybe they're willing to listen. And that's the part that gives me some kind of hope, you know? And I will say, we're kind of coming to the end of our time, but I kind of wanted to talk about Juneteenth for a little bit because one of the one of the most immediate ways yes. of recognition of Black life is this, this kind of wave of companies decide, including our own, deciding that Juneteenth is can be recognized as a holiday. And I have mixed feelings about it. You know, the Nike CEO said it would be a paid a paid holiday for all employees. Jack tweeted out that that Twitter and Square would recognize annually Juneteenth as a holiday. 
And I, I have so many emotions about it, you know, like I really do. I mean, I think in the, in the terms of, in the case of Twitter and, and tech companies, um, I was like, well, what are Twitter's diversity numbers? You know, and I took a look and in 2018, I think it was actually 2019, they said, our goals for the year in terms of number of employees, 5%, like our goal is to have 5% of our, com I mean, these companies, Square especially, Twitter doesn't make a ton of money, but, but Square especially makes a lot of money. And so when I think a lot about equality and nominal gestures, you know, these are companies that have benefited from black culture, Twitter especially, and made a lot of money off the backs of, of free black labor and excluded an entire generation of potential entrepreneurs and, and venture capitalists and people because there are no black people at those companies. They didn't, they didn't get any of the money that those companies have made as they've gone public and have had these, mm -hmm. these multi-billion dollar um, initial public offerings. But so, you know, Twitter's like, well, we're, our goal for 2019 is to get to 5% of our workforce. Babe, they didn't hit it. <laughs> they didn't hit it. They could not get to 5%. So, I, you know, for me, that's a little bit frustrating. I, I, I've definitely, I'm like, well, what does it mean then? Who's, who is celebrating Juneteenth at Twitter? <laughs> yeah, I but, mean. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we should take, we, we don't have much time. Yeah. Um, the Juneteenth thing is a really important, fascinating, deep question um, that I have a lot of feelings about, many, many strongly mixed feelings about just in terms of, of what it means to celebrate it and who is celebrating and what is being celebrated actually. And, um, but let's, do you wanna take some questions before we, before we have to go? So we, we have the, the questions are here. So if anybody has any more questions, um, they'll be filtered to us and I can keep an eye on them. Um, and we can take a couple of questions. I also wanna to say too that um, Wesley and I pulled together a black self-care package with links to articles, um, wellness facilitators, some sound healing things that'll be in the comments. And if you don't see it, you can always reach out to me on Instagram and I'm happy to share it with you. But I wanted to make sure that our black listeners left with a little bit of extra nourishment. Um, but well, while I'm waiting for a couple, of, um, I just wanna say about Juneteenth though, Wesley, you know, it absolutely should be a federal holiday, you know, and it, it, it is about the deferral of information and it is about the withholding of freedom and mm -hmm. so i think as long as we celebrate it with that in mind you know like mm -hmm. really yeah. Yeah. like the, the and, and if people don't know what juneteenth is look it up um full stop look it up but what i will say is that when the messengers were trying to get to the enslaved to tell them hey you know the union won like you're free a lot of those messengers didn't make it to Texas. Like they did not, they were intercepted and they were killed along the way. And, and there's something about that that's so meaningful to me. There's something about that, like on the 19th this year, I will really be sitting at my altar, you know? Like there's something really powerful about that. Um, yeah, okay, so I'm just getting to the questions. Um, there's a question from somebody named Chase. Thank you for your question, Chase. But, you know, where is your hope coming from? What helps you access the hope and not just feel despair? Hmm. Um, that this is different. This is, this is fundamentally different. Every, every elder that I've spoken to recognizes that it's different. Um, a lot of older people feel hope. I mean, you know, John Lewis, there's a documentary about, about the congressman and civil rights hero, John Lewis, um, that's coming out in a couple of weeks, I believe. Maybe, maybe July, I can't remember, but it's, it's on its way. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot about what, you know, I'm praying for him every day, by the way, in his health. I know. Um, but what must it be like to be a John Lewis level person, a Jesse Jackson level person and see what is happening right now? Um, and and to, to, to know that there is something different about what's going on. Um, and I think that that is a, that is a thing that, that it, but I think hope is important. I think hope is, you know, we're, we are a people of hope, even when it doesn't seem like we should have any or, or should, you know, be hopeful at all. 
we we have it, we keep it. It's a little pilot light that keeps us going, a lot of us. And I think I don't want to I don't want to be at hope yet. I want to be at observance. I want to still be mad. I still want to be in awe of what is happening. I'm not hope. Hope is kind of always there for me. Um, yeah. But for people who are despairing, I think that just compare, I don't know how, I don't know, you know, what's happening in individual people's lives, but if we're talking about changing this country, I think the last two weeks have, have opened up, brought up, shaken loose so much. And I think that there, there's hope to be found in, in all that chaos. Mm. Well, well put, beautifully said. What's our next question? Can we, how long, are they gonna cut us off? What's gonna happen? Are they, we all gonna be sent, you know, back to our couches? Um, let's no, just take a couple more questions until somebody. Okay. Well, there's one last question, which I think we can answer, which is, what are you grateful for right now? Hmm. The past. Every single person who tried to do what is happening right now and lost their life. That's right. Every person who lost their life who was just trying to live. Yeah. Um, I am grateful for for the hope that we have had. I mean, I saw the, you know, a very widely watched video um, that's happened that, that somebody made in the last couple of weeks of that, of that woman um, that truly enraged, like just the most eloquently enraged um, monologue I've ever heard a person give um, where she is just, I mean, she is, you know, convulsing with anger. But yeah. her mind is so clear. Yeah. And at the yeah. end, yeah. at the end of the video, she says, "This country should be grateful that we're a people." I'm going to get it wrong. Let me think. We're, this country paraphrase. should be grateful because that we're people uh, that we just want equality and not revenge. That's right. That's and right. I am grateful for every person who has who has tried to just get equality. Equality. It is the lowest level ask you could possibly give another person is to make them equal. Absolutely. Um, and so Absolutely. I, I, you know, I have always been grateful for, for, for the people who've gone before us, um, whether mm. they were fighting for freedom or just fighting for air. Mm. Um, mm. I'm really grateful for that. What about you? Beautiful. Um, oh my gosh. I mean, I'm grateful to be alive. I'm grateful to be able to use this platform. I'm grateful to hold space. You know, I, I feel very called to this work that you and I do. And I think that it is important and it is dire. And I'm grateful that um, I feel prepared. I feel prepared for right yeah. now, you know? That's I don't think I was ready. I wasn't That's ready in, in 2012, 2013, 14, mm -hmm. 50 year. You know, it was, mm -hmm. it was so painful. I didn't have the tools to really allow myself to feel the, the deep grief and the anger and the rage and the fatigue. And, and I, you know, I, I've been working on myself to really get to a place where I can hold so much emotion and not be afraid of it because to face the unfairness and cruelty that black people face in this country world is to face your own um, obsolescence in a way, you know, it's like to really, to really sit with what it means to, I mean, we are living under a government that does not value black life and will contain, has no problem showing us over and over again, how little doesn't it doesn't value and, anybody's life. For, yeah. I, mean, but, yeah, I mean, but I'm just going to keep I, it centered. Just, on. I know, I know. I just, but, but, <laughs> but to say that, I guess what I'm really trying to say, though, is that to be a Black person in America is to face existential despair because how do you grapple with 
the love, the depths of disregard and, 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 and lack of care and still get up in the morning, you know? And so I think I'm really grateful that I have the tools for myself and I'm also in a position to share them with others. So I don't know. It's hard. I feel like I feel equipped and I feel ready. And I feel really like it. that's powerful. Like the readiness, the readiness. Yeah. I feel that is part of what, that is part of what this moment is for me too. I'm, I'm ready. And I think so ready. many of us are ready. Yeah. We've been ready, but I mean, this is the moment for all that, for all that previous work. Um, I agree. We're ready. That feels like a good note to end on. I mean, thank you to everybody who tuned in. Thank you to everybody who follows our work, who's still with us, you know, um, who took time out of their day to sit and have this conversation with us. And um, I don't know, we're thinking about you guys and take good care. And hopefully by now, the Black Self Care Package is in the comments. And again, you can reach out Twitter, Instagram, and I'm happy to share it there as well. But just, we're thinking about you all, you know, and stay yes. hydrated, stay healthy, get tested as much as you can, as much as you can find the time for, because we're still in the middle of a pandemic. Um, despite the insistence of everywhere that we're not, we are, and we're, we're vulnerable. So um, I don't know. Is there anything else you yes. want to say before we head out, Wesley? Just thank you and, and stay ready, everybody. I mean, and thanks to the time staff for putting this together and Yes. Um, you know, letting us yes. do this. All the, um, all the New York Times live events folks and social media folks and technology folks who are also, you know, helping support us. Absolutely. So thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. And uh, we'll be back. Uh, we're going to do, we're going we're gonna to get back. Well, not in the studio, but we'll be recording soon. Bye, guys. Bye, Jenna. Bye, Wesley. I'll talk to you in like five minutes. Okay.